All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining in. Um, so this is the panel in, in conversation with Janice Ray and Amy Wright. We're going to be talking about their latest books and, um, and talking about the writing process as well. Um, so first, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and um, welcome you on behalf of, the, of Humanities Tennessee. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to, um, to thank our key sponsors. So that includes Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. Um, so supporting all of those places and um, purchasing books through Parnassus will help to keep this festival free. Um, so yeah. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if you're watching in Facebook or YouTube live, you can uh, submit questions. So at the end of the session, we'll have some time for some Q&A. So you can submit those questions uh, whenever you want and we'll get to those at the end of the session. Um, and then if you would like to donate to the festival, then you can do that at um, www uh humtn.org so that's hum as in humanities tn as in tennessee so humtn.org um yeah so thanks everybody first i would like to start by introducing um amy wright so amy wright is the author of paper concert a conversation in the round so that's this book right here um which came out this year um and she is also the author of three books of poetry and six chapbooks she has received two P uh, Peter Taylor Fellowships to the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop, an Individual Artist Fellowship from the Tennessee Arts Commission, and a fellowship to Virginia Center uh, for the Creative Arts. Her essays and poems appear in Fourth Genre, Georgia Review, Ninth Letter, and elsewhere. So welcome, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, there she is. Hi, Amy. Hi. Thank you so much, Allie. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Looking forward to talking with you. Thank you. Um, and next, I would like to introduce Janice Ray. Janice is a writer working at the crossroads of landscape and story. You may know her first book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, which I also have right here. Um, she is the author of four other books of literary nonfiction and two collections of poetry. Janice has won a Pushcart Prize, an American Book Award, and a Southern Environmental Law Center Writing Award. Her essay collection, Wild Spectacle, Seeking Wonders in the World Beyond Humans, which is right here, the beautiful cover, uh, it will be out in a month from Trinity University Press. So welcome, Janice, and thanks for joining us. There she is. Hi, Janice. Hi. All right. So yeah, so today I would like to talk about, uh, dig a little bit into both of these books that you both have coming out. Um, and, and talk a little bit about the writing process um, and see where that conversation takes us. So first, I would like to ask Amy if you could tell us a little bit about Paper Concert. Um, tell us a little bit about the shape that this book takes um, and, and to get a sense of your voice, I wondered if you could uh, read a little bit of this piece to us. Sure, I'd be glad to. Paper Concert has, was born over about a decade plus um, of interviews that I conducted largely for Zone 3 Literary Journal, um, but also for a variety of journals, New Orleans Review, um, Guernica, um, published several of them. But I had a wide variety of conversations with poets, artists, musicians, filmmakers, um, and just a wide variety of people. And so then I put them all in conversation with each other mm -hmm. around this idea of a paper concert, which was inspired by the artist Kel Black, um, whose work, um, whose paper works were particularly moving to me. Um, and so I'll begin with, th there are nine sections in the book. Each section of the book introduces a, a kind of theme for the conversation. So we talk about class, we talk about um, race, we talk about the environmental crisis. Um, and in this one, I start with an essay about my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. My mother's mother saved fabric for quilts flannel shirts her boys had outgrown, her daughter's cotton nightgowns, denim her husband had worn soft, scraps bagged and sold for a penny at yard sales. Her two favorite patterns for these color blocks were bow ties and Dutch dolls. 
She had quilts in progress until the day she died and baskets overflowing with starts in various stages of completion. While she stitched, I sat on the floor and sandwiched stacks of gabardine, corduroy, poplin, chenille, lace, and cotton, mixing and matching colors to mimic layers of hamburger, pimento cheese, etc., which flopped and sagged when I pretended to bite into them like the words to which they belonged. The textures of both delighted me. I slept under quilts had fever dreams when sick with the flu and starry-eyed daydreams when swooning into love under patchwork patterns that gave me the sense that everything that had ever been would turn up again in some other form. My family didn't believe in reincarnation, but reincarnated objects surrounded us. Old tires became tree swings, clawfoot bathtubs were repurposed as feed troughs, my grandfather saved baler twine, which he used to fasten everything from cattle gates to tailgates. My mother saved paper bags, buttons, and wood from fallen trees on the farm to make our mantle board, coffee table, and picture frames. My grandmother converted chipped plates into plant saucers, collaged broken glass into tabletop mosaics, and my father did his part by wearing new t-shirts to the field as soon as possible so they became fit for what my mother called the rag bag. I learned to dust using my own cotton diaper cloths. Inevitably, I began to save conversations that mattered once I came to value them in Rhonda Simmerman's ninth grade English class, material, we called it, on the newspaper staff in college. So hopefully that gives you some sense for how I wanted to save things. And so I saved the many conversations I conducted over that decade plus um, and repackaged them in this form to hold on to that knowledge and to share it with others. It's great, thank you. I love how, how that kind of informs your construction of this book, of this project, you know, and how, how all those questions and uh, interview questions and essays come together. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Janice, uh, now we would like to hear a little bit about your book. So we have Wild Spectacle. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about um, about the the book and this collection of essays. Yeah, right there. Oh, Beautiful. I love oh, this cover too. Oh, you uh, actually have the galley. Okay, great. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So yeah. I was I was looking back through work that had never published or you know had never been collected, and I saw this theme of enchantment um, running through it. And um, so the book is, it's, it's essays and they are divided, um, not chronologically as is usually my habit. And I think an, an easy way, an easy structure for the human mind, but they're, they are divided, they're, it's, the movement in the book is idea driven. So the first section is called, uh, I forget what it is. It's, about, it's mainly about Montana, which is where I first, like first set foot in wildness and also where I became a writer. Oh yeah, that section is called Meridian. And then the, sex, the second section is tra our travels to far, more farther flung places. And um, that section is called Migration. And then there's so there's three movements and the third is magnitude and which is it's a weird title because it's really more um, place based like more honing in um, there there are other there are other themes and ideas that hold those pieces together but that's basically it so I was remembering um, this quote by Diane Ackerman and she says that she doesn't want to get to the end of her life and realize that, that she had just lived the length of it, you know, that she wanted to have lived the width of it as well. And I think Allison, that that is the, that's pretty much the arc of the book, which is the art, the three, the three sections are sort of like the line itself the length of the line and the width of the line. So, um, and then I, I wanna say this because I, I truly believe there's a fourth section that's not in the table of contents and it, it's spirit really. It's, it's the section where um, I get with you and you get to, the reader gets to interact with me. It's, it's this, it's this place. It's the space that, 
gets left in any book for magic to happen. And I, I truly believe that's in this one. Um, I'd like, I'm going to read you a piece that is actually from the preface. Um, Although I was reared on a junkyard by parents who didn't waste time hiking or camping, I knew pine trees and pitcher plants, bobcats and brown thrashers as my people. I understood wild things as beings with intentions, foremost a searing desire to, leave, to lead pleasant, fulfilling lives. Once the storyteller Joseph Bruchak told me about people to whom animals are attracted. And oddly, later I met uh, such a person, um, an Abenaki man named Ones, who visited environmental science classes at a university where I was in residence. So the, uh, my colleagues there, I better start reading again. My colleagues told me about odd things that occurred during Ones's visits. While he sat outside with students, animals would ease up to listen to him. It might be an alligator or a heron, a squirrel or a turtle. Then when Ones visited my own class, a black racer came sliding along with its head out of the mown grass, circling behind Ones before hunkering down as if to listen. The essays in this book are about the desire to immerse myself in the varied wild, to survey the territory of wildness, to be wild, and perhaps to become the kind of person who listens to animals and to whom animals listen. It's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that. Uh, that that preface, I think, is a great way to start this book off. Um, so, yeah. So, Amy, I'm kind of wanting to hear a little bit more about your process of creating this book. Like, um, there's a lot of interview questions and, and responses in this book. And I'm wondering... Um, how that kind of came to be, how this project evolved over time. Was it something that you knew you wanted to do for a long time and have been interviewing people with this in mind? Or did you just interview people for fun and then find out you had all of these things that you could put in conversation with each other? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Thanks. It, it's largely the process of my own curiosity unfolding in the book. And so I think of the book to some extent as a kind of memoir, because it's really the voices that have shaped me and my education as I ask questions that interested me, everything from you know the, the climate crisis to um, what it's like to grow up native in America. I mean, it's a wide range of experiences that weren't my own, um, but that you need to understand in order to process what it is to be an American, um, multiple perspectives. Um, and that's why it's dedicated to my students because they've been real educators for me too in asking questions that I couldn't answer myself and I would have to go do the field research, research that I encourage them to do um, in order to be able to understand um, my own perspective fully. That's great. Yeah, thanks, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, so Janice, I'm interested, you were talking um, just a, a minute ago about uh, a fourth section being kind of about spirit in, in this work. And I'm interested in, um, you write in a few of these essays about duende, right? That difficult to define artistic kind of turn um, that we use uh, for, for kind of to describe that creativity and soul that we find in art. Um, and I'm wondering, you put the you put Duende in conversation with the natural world in this in this essay collection. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you find Duende in 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 the natural world, in plants and animals and humans, and how all of those interact with each other, and maybe even try to give us a little um, definition of Duende. You mentioned, I think, you say something in in um, in this book. You define it as mystery, struggle, and darkness. Um, so yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, it's such a great question, Allison. Thank <laughs> you so much. Um, I, I, I won't go into it very much. I seriously explore the whole idea in this essay um, about uh, Cabo Blanco, Cabo Blanco a place in Costa Rica. Um, the, the essay is written in point 
counterpoint and the Duende sections are the counterpoint sections. The point sections are the, you know, this evolution is a love story that's unraveling. And I, I thought maybe I could just read a couple of those counterpoints sections about Duende and its relationship to humans, the natural world. Um, if Duende is what is real, it, if it is power and magneto, if it is mystery, then the monkeys had Duende, the museum had Duende, the seething ocean had Duende, the beans on Maria's oilcloth had Duende. And, and here's another one. If spirit is what the eye cannot see, then silence is what the ear cannot hear. If noise is superficial, then silence is profundity. Silence is a deeper listening. Silence is shamanic. If some music has Duende, so does some silence. There's no primeval silence. All of mystery has a sound. Spirit has sound. Um, I, I, I do want to say that the, those, although those sound philosophical, like I am really writing mostly in anecdote in that, but in these tiny sections exploring this amazing idea of, of basically where art comes from. Yeah, that's, that's great. I love that. Um, I love that whole essay. Um, it, it really, it does a, a deep dive into, into what Duende means through your experiences, which is great. Um, yeah, so going back to Amy, uh, several of these essays reference your childhood in the Appalachian Mountains, right, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I'm wondering how, if you could speak a little bit to how uh, that landscape informs this book. And even if you had a section of the book that you wanted to read about your childhood in the Appalachian Mountains, that would be great too. Thanks. I, I was lucky enough to grow up um, surrounded by the Jefferson National Forest. And so it was quite idyllic in the sense that there were just so many um, different insects and, and species around there. Um, but culturally, it was also very rich um, in subtlety and in listening um, to the silences between people um, and the silences in conversation. And so I think that really informed my interview process because you can hear in the things that people don't say where the really meaty territory is. Um, and you learn that by listening to, you know, Appalachian people who are more reticent in general, especially in my family, at least. I can only really um, draw from that experience, but they, um, my mother had a whole rich language of silence. Um, and so I, I, I can read into those silences. So I, I think that's probably the biggest, um, the biggest connection, but also just how to develop rapport between people who don't necessarily um, welcome um, rapport easily. Um, I think when you're just entering into these conversations just with strangers, um, something about that um, comfortability with discomfort can come in, come in handy. The section I might, I actually am going to give you a representation of, of how the book works. Um, I'd like to actually share um, a, a question that I really resonate with um, and that speaks to this question. I, I said, how did your how did your relationship to nature form? And I asked it of one of my former students who I'm very proud of, Raven Jackson. She's a filmmaker. She has two MFAs, um, one in filmmaking and one in creative writing from NYU. And she's, she's very accomplished. She's won a number of awards. Um, and she says this about how her relationship to nature formed. One of my earliest memories is of splitting a fat worm in two for my father as we fished on the edge of the Cumberland River. I remember dirt under my nails, my feet. I remember the dark whiskers of the catfish we caught. I think I fell in love with nature then. Fishing opened the door for me. As a photographer, I'm particularly interested in taking photos of black bodies in natural environments, breathing, existing, taking up space, in my poetry and films, I tend to have imagery of fishing, trees and fields, rain. These are some of my obsessions. For instance, in my poem, All Dirt Roads Taste of Salt, which became the title for my feature film project, I write, quote, winter, the trees won't stop screaming. I put on a dress I've lost the buttons to, refuse to stay home. 
In the feature film I'm currently writing, my protagonist has a strong relationship with rain. It reminds her of her mother who passed away when she was young. The water, water cycle of rain is an image I find myself returning to often. For me, how rain changes form is reminiscent of how energy changes form. There's something deeply powerful in writing a character that swallowed rain as a child and as an adult emotionally connects with her mother in the drops. Great, thank you so much. I did not know that uh, Raven Jackson was one of your former students. I've I've been I've uh, heard her speak before, and she had a lot of really interesting things to say. I think that was a great reading. Um, yeah, great. So now I would like to ask Janice a little bit about um, her journal writing process. Um, I was lucky enough to get a spot in one of her workshops um, probably about three years ago now. And I remember that she brought out this, uh, her journal that she writes in, and it was, it, it had a life of its own. It was um, really fascinating. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your journal writing process um, and, and if these essays that you have in this book started out in that journal in some form uh, and how they kind of evolved into essays um, yeah. I decided to bring you on and, and show you, Allison. I mean, I know you've seen them before, mm -hmm. but um, I usually write in these art books, which are, they, they don't have lines usually, and they're, they get, they get just full of, that says my dad's grace. So that, you know, my, I just wrote down what my dad how he blessed the food, but it's, it's really everything. It's notes as I listen to podcasts and starts of poems. And this one has been, I have been indexing them. This one is not indexed. You can tell if I've numbered the pages, but while I'm working on some project, I will often, you know, like annotate it in some way. The journal that I'm currently working with is um, a moleskin and it is lined, but it's the same. And okay, okay. So at different stages in my life, I have different writing processes. And um, I learned from Robert Olin Butler uh, about in a certain on a certain day, look back through events of the past few days that cause some amazing strong reaction, emotional reaction in you and then render that moment to moment through the senses as a scene. So if I write like that every day, then I just lift those entire pieces right out of my journal. And, um, but mainly um, now I, I am not writing like that. And there, there are many, many reasons why the pandemic is probably one of them. But um, my journal right now is a lot of, of self-exploration, reflection, and so forth. And, and to just, I think to answer your question, Allison, yes, most of them, most of them wound up in some form in a journal and then they were lifted either a journal or field notes. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I remember, I remember from that workshop, we, uh, you brought those journals out and they were just magnificent. And you also gave us a lot of prompts for how, how we could, um, keep our own journals. And, and I still have all those and use those. So that's great. Um, that's great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then Amy, I, uh, you are also one of my uh, professors when I was studying creative writing at Austin P State University. And I learned a lot from you. Um, and one of the things that I remember you telling us uh, and teaching us a lot about was the importance of research in, in your creative work, right? And clearly this uh, this book also required a lot of research in the form of interview questions. So I'm kind of wondering if you can can tell us a little bit about research, if you did other kinds of research outside of interviewing, in, of just writing these interview questions and conducting these interviews, research maybe to prepare you for the interviews and how research is important to your work, maybe even outside of this book. Great, thanks. I, I like to show my students that research can be creative. Um, for me, it's very um, generative, you know, to read something, to learn something. I mean, I think I'm a natural student. And so maybe that's, you know, why I teach because I, I continue to learn in the classroom always. Um, but for me, research just 
gets my mind going in all of these different directions. And so um, it inspires me to want to talk to people um, and inspires me to want to learn more. Um, and so a lot of the research um, was field research, but that started because I was doing book research. And so I would be reading someone's um, book. Most recently, I just read um, Victoria Chang's Dear Memory. And uh, you know, I, I reached out to her to have a conversation to, to um, expand that. And that's just how it, how it works. I'll pick up a book and I'll think, oh, I want to know more about this. And the other way that it works is in zone three, somebody might send us essays. Um, I, I've been the nonfiction editor um, for a number of years. And sometimes I just want to deepen the conversation in an essay or open some level of access to the essay. And so we'll have a conversation that's about their work. Um, and so that's that's really how it goes. It's, it's all close reading driven um, to a large extent. But then because my close reading is always driven by human questions, um, I tend to ask things like, um, you know, when in your life have you felt the freest? And I, I didn't realize I was asking that so much until I compiled all of the interviews um, years later, never having planned this. I, I didn't answer that part of the question before. I didn't know that this book was going to um, come down the pike at some point. Um, but I, um, I would ask them, um, when in your life have you felt the freest? Because I, I guess that was just a central question to me. And so that runs throughout the book. Um, different people answer it in different ways. And I think we learned that we would also answer it differently on any given day ourselves. So when asked. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I love that. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, and Janice, I'm kind of, since you were talking about, um, about kind of your process for your for keeping your journal regularly spending you know every few days write down those moments that that um that stood out to you i'm kind of wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what your daily writing process is like um do you do most of it in your journal by hand um do you spend some time every day you know taking pieces out of that journal and typing them up on a computer and kind of creating something that you would be willing to send out for publication or just kind of you know what's your daily writing process like mm -hmm. so um writing isn't just my art it's also my trade and i mean that's what's so different about me as a writer is is i it, i'm all day at my desk you know and but the the actual work happens mostly in the morning it can happen anytime but it's mostly in the morning and and it's it comes i i i'm actually physically writing you know um i want to say if i have the time to write because so many other things are you know come about when you're a writer um i, I want to talk just a minute about creativity I think creativity is so important because it's the act of creating something. And we live in a time when we're just really actively destroying a lot of things. You know, we're kind of deconstructing the planet. We're uncreating a lot and tearing apart a lot. And I also really believe that stories are transformative. I believe that stories can transform one person's life, many lives, a town, a country, the entire world, you know, we can see that happened with the Bible, you know, incredibly transformative. But I also, however, think that we're in a time, this technological, really divisive time, when um, making something artifactual can also be destructive. And I mean, this is really weird for me to say, because we're all about books and writing, and so am I. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm an incredible reader, but um, I think that trying, you know, to get people to look at us is not necessarily making art or trying to be famous or to get a bigger Twitter following. So um, the way my writing process is, has been changing lately is that I know, I don't really believe anymore that it's the most important thing that I could be doing, you know? I just the same as I don't believe that me being educated gives me the right to fly anywhere I want in the world using up fossil fuels. I just think we're in a different space on the planet. And many days I decide to practice that, you know, today's a day for planting. It's not a day for writing. 
So I, so Allison, let me just, let me kind of just wrap that up because I've said a lot in there. And, and so what I'm saying is I believe fully in books and in writing and in stories. And also I question it, you know, I question mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I love how, um, how those concerns of, of your writing process and your concerns for the environment kind of come together. And that um, we are unfortunately running out of time. I had so many more questions to ask you guys, but I want to I want to turn it over to the Q and A. Um, so we've got a lot of questions from our listeners. But before I do that, I wonder if you both could give us one last piece of advice as as writers and readers and and just members of this earth. If you had any final advice to share with us, maybe uh, Amy, can we start with you? Sure. I, the biggest advice that I give to any young or emerging writer is always to read widely. Um, and so, and talk um, to as many people as you can read outside your comfort zone, because ultimately as writers, we have to get comfortable with vulnerability and exposure, um, putting ourselves out there. And so it's just good practice to begin by talking to people who are unlike us, learning about that, putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions in order to kind of acclimate to that. And, mm -hmm. and for my answer, I'm going to read just this tiny section from the end of one of the essays. And it, it's really one line. It's most of us, most of our lives are asked to live small. Most of us quit trying very young to live the bigness we know is possible. I love that. That's a perfect answer from both of you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for talking. And I'm going to turn over and ask some of these questions that are popping up in the chat over here. Um, so the first one is for both of you. Do you believe that writer's block is a real thing? And if so, how do you work through it? I think that's a question that that most of us writers um, deal with at one time, time or another. Um, so yeah, maybe let's start with Janice. Do you have any strategies for, for writer's block? Yeah, so I, I'm going to say I'm going to have a, a, a bipolar answer, really, because I, I really don't believe in it for myself. But of course, it's a real thing. Grief is a real thing. You know, if you sit down and you can't write, that's a very real thing. But I think I think the work is in showing up at the desk. I really do. And I think once you show up, it it comes, it happens. So I'm, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I will say I don't experience writer's block and I don't know that I ever have. Mm -hmm. I experience the, I experience writing, poor writing. You know, there are times when I show up to write and that the Duende is not there, but it, it's the, it's, it's about showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I remember in your in that workshop I took with you, um, we spent several minutes doing a lot of, of free writing to get us started. Um, and you said something about that, about just showing up to the desk every day um, and making it happen. Um, yeah. Amy, do you have any answer for this question? It's a confrontation, you know, the blank page, the open space. Um, and so I think anytime we have that confrontation with our own vulnerability, um, with something that we don't know, it's rich territory and it's also intimidating territory. And so I, my students and I talk a lot about going into that unknown territory and we have lots of little tips and tools and tricks um, like the Alipos we were just talking about today and their, um, you know, different poetic devices, you know, to take a poem and, and write, you know, you know, the, the nouns with plus seven in the dictionary. I mean, there are all kinds of little tricks you can do to just get yourself to that desk that Janice is talking about um, and getting it flowing again so that you don't feel so scared. Yeah, that's great. Um, our next question is also for both of you that you both write a lot about nature. Um, and this question is, did the pandemic slow down your lives and change the ways you interact with and write about the natural world? Um, should we start with Janice again? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, so the question, Allison, say it again. Did the pandemic slow? slow did this? Yeah. Did the pandemic slow down your lives and change the ways you interact with and uh, write about the natural world? You know, it was probably the pl the pandemic that brought about like these deep internal explorations I'm having about you know writing itself and what I need to be doing. 
Um, I loved the pandemic for the things, not for the death and the sorrow and the grief, but for the things that it, I loved looking up at the sky and not seeing the contrails of, of, of airplanes, you know. I, I just loved being in the garden and being more contemplative and reading more. It brought me, I was, I'm thinking about Amy's question about when you're freest. And it really brought me back to these places in childhood where I was, you know, felt very free. That's great. Yeah. Um, Amy, how about, how's the pandemic affected your, your writing? I spent a lot more time in nature because I couldn't go to the gym. I couldn't go to several of the events that I would have gone to. And so, you know, we went and spent a lot of time outside. Um, and so I definitely, it really deepens um, your relationships to people to be in nature and, you know, not having the barrier of um, a screen or a TV or, or something between you. Um, and so, yeah, I think it changed my relationships and in turn my writing through that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I definitely relate to that. You know, eventually after staring at my computer screen for so long during the pandemic, I had to get outside at some point. Um, so yeah, th those are great responses. Um, our next question is about how do you find your agents and publishers and do you have any advice for writers who want to be published? Uh, let, you wanna start with Amy this time or Janice? It doesn't matter, <laughs> whichever one. Um, I'll go. Would you read the question? I'm sorry. Would you read the question again? You're good. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how did you find your agents and publishers? Do you have advice for writers who want to be published? You know, I, th yeah. So, it, so, so much is relational and this may be a, this may be too simplistic an answer, but the, the, my first agent I found at a conference, and who, and, you know, she had come to the conference as well. And I began to talk to her and honestly, that happens a lot. Like, so yeah, it's just, it's often that friends talk to a friend and that's how the word gets out. So I really encourage people to like, to come to the Southern Festival of Books and meet people, especially when we're back in, you know, when we're back real, you know, around each other in real time. Um, other than that, I think I would I would send people to Stephen Buhner's book called Insoling Language. And there's a chapter in the very beginning where he says you have to recognize there's a brick wall and your job is to chip at the wall until there's a crack. And then your job is to make the crack bigger. And so I think for beginning writers, it sometimes seems it seems so daunting. The wall seems impossibly thick. And, but I, I think that you ne you just cannot give up showing up at your desk and chipping away at the wall. Yeah, can you, can you repeat that writer and book again for us real yes. quick? Buhner is B-U-H-N-E-R, Stephen Buhner. And the book is called Insoling Language. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Amy, do you have any advice for publishing, especially for, for new writers? I would underscore the, um, the advice to go to conferences and book fairs. That's just a quick way in to find that community and hold on to your writing community. Make friends. Um, they're going to be your readers. And if you have readers that will expand and open your voice, you have a better chance of getting into that publishing market because we all have just our singular limited perspectives until we think of other people's perspectives and really round out our own points of view. Great. Um, our next question is one that I'm excited about. It is, um, what other forms of art inspire and inform your writing, such as art, uh, like visual art and music? Um, I know, Amy, you have some uh, interview questions with writers you, uh, or with uh, artists and musicians. So maybe you can start us off with this question. I, I might just use the word collage because I think that that um, captures a lot of what interests me, um, you know, collage where you bring together different forms. Um, the single artist who um, inspired this book, Kel Black, um, looking at his work and thinking about that, um, it was instrumental in imagining what kind, 
what the design of this book would look like, looking at Kel's master, um, master works of his paper sculptures, um, and then Billy Wrinkle's collage. Both of these were art, retired and, and then current um, artists at Austin P. So I'm surrounded by visual artists. And of course, musicians were right outside of Nashville. Um, you know, I could go on and on about the, the, um, the fruitfulness of like interdisciplinary art speaking to each other. The same. My husband is a painter and I'm, I'm sitting in front of a couple of his paintings, but he is a, an extremely devoted painter. Um, every day he's doing, you know, he's a very fast worker too. So every day he's doing uh, two or three, actually. He works very fast. I, I have to add to art the, the beauty of nature. You know, I pay so much attention to to not just what's happening in in the woods or in the fields, but also in like in my little pollinator garden. And I realize I surround myself with as much beauty as possible because it inspires me so much. Um, all of the arts. But let, let me say, let me just add one thing that Amy is, has talked about, and that is community, you know, the community of people. I know this is not an art form, or maybe it is, you know, maybe another human being is a work of art, but I'm just so incredibly inspired by my relationships with others, you know, and, and, and like, as Amy's saying, I really try to nurture those. I mean, it may be just an idea that somebody I'm in conversation with somebody about something else completely different. And they say something in a way that I think I'd love to write about that. And yeah, it's a great response. Um, yeah, that was beautiful. Uh, and I wonder if uh, the next question I want to ask is about um, editing, right? So how your favorite editors function and what your worst editing experience has been, maybe your best editing experience as well. Um, Janice, can you talk to us a little bit about editing? Yeah, I a lot of people have a hard time with editors because they don't want changes. You know, it's it's our baby and we just don't want you messing with it. But um, I I think an editor is a writer's like truly best friend. Um, I have been saved from so many terrible mistakes by a great editor. So I love the editing process. My favorite process in the, in the whole writing process, my favorite process is actually revising, especially revising when I have it in my camp, but I completely love it when I give it to somebody and they see leaps that I didn't see. That's great. Yeah, I wish we had more time to talk about the revising process as well. That's a fascinating uh, part of writing, right? Amy, do you have anything to add about editing? I would just say that an editor can sometimes do that thing Janice is talking about of surprising you about your own work. Um, something wonderful happened in the midst of this book, thanks to Mark Gabba. He turned the interview over on me. And so he started asking me questions and he asked this question, how does revision figure into creation as you've described it? And I say, it may be the answer inside Blake's poem, a good revision frames art's feel, fearful symmetry. And so I do think there's something fearful about that symmetry. And then once it clicks into place, we recognize what the symmetry is. And sometimes it takes somebody else to point that out to us. That was great. Yeah, thank you guys both so much. Um, that is the end of our questions in the Q&A and the end of our time together. So, um, so yeah, thank you both so much for meeting with me. I wish you both the best of luck. Thank you for all of our listeners who tuned in and those who are listening um, to the recording after, after the session is over. Um, yeah, thank you both. Thank, thank you, you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.